You know, I, I spend a lot, a lot of time thinking about uh, one of the key themes that Dale mentioned around detection response, and specifically, you know, how can organizations build you know, practical and effective strategies um, for how to detect badness or, or evil in, in their environment? So the title of this talk is Security Guards versus, versus Motion Detectors. Uh, so what does that mean? So say that you have to defend uh, a store, you know, a retail store from thieves. Uh, and you've got a couple different options, right? So the ones that we'll talk about here are, you know, security guards. In this case, I've got a picture of a security guard positioned at every single aisle of the store where they're, you know, on post and kind of looking at um, everything that's happening in that aisle. And then you have a motion detector. Uh, which is a different approach, right? So the motion detector is going to be able to understand that, hey, the, the thief or you know, someone's moving around the store and potentially they went down you know, this aisle based on the motion and you can generate an alert right, or something around that and then potentially um, you know, dispatch a security guard or someone to take a look at that. But you don't really have you know, an understanding other than, hey, something just moved or someone's in that, that different aisle. So, you know, kind of how does this apply uh, to network security monitoring and specifically network security monitoring for industrial control systems? Let's go through kind of a thought exercise around breadth versus depth. So the first thing, I'm going to give you a budget of 100 euro, and that's what you have to spend on defending your environment. Okay, you've got 100 industrial facilities that you need to protect from bad guys that are trying to disrupt your uh, industrial processes or, or cause harm to your organization. And you've got two options. So the first option is for two euro, you can have a network sensor that's going to tell you absolutely everything about um, what's going on in one site. You have full visibility into you know, all the network communications and you know, everything that's happening in terms of communication amongst the different you know, network nodes and industrial devices that are deployed at that site. Um, the second option only costs you one euro, but in exchange for that uh, cheaper price, you're gonna get only metadata around you know, what's going on in the environment. So you can see maybe you know, who's talked to who, you can see maybe some of the characteristics of that um, you know, conversation uh, and different things like that. So the question is, which one would you choose? So really when you kind of analyze that decision, with option one, it's very attractive to know everything that's going on in the facility, right? And, and of course, that's sort of your default position is that you, know, you do want to know everything. But you don't have enough budget for that, right? In the example that I gave, you can only uh, monitor using that mechanism uh, half of your facilities or half of your sites. So unless you have some way to prioritize that or you are able to really definitively say that half of your sites don't matter, right, from a, from a cybersecurity perspective, um, you're only really getting 50% coverage, right? Um, in the other case, you don't know everything, right, about the facilities, but, you know, theoretically, at, you know, one euro per site with 100 facilities, you can now put a sensor out at every site, right, and get 100% um, coverage and visibility, uh, but only with metadata, with sort of limited information, right, about, about each site. Uh, but you do have every site under some form of monitoring, and perhaps you can go back and ask for more budget, right, or, or talk about, uh, or maybe, you know, do more investigation on a point-by-point -point or case-by-case or -case basis. Um, and this is a thought exercise, so I also want to point out that this is a trick question, because you've just spent all of your budget on technology. So now, when there's alerts or anything's actually generated by this technology, who's actually going to do anything about it, right? So you need to actually think about, you know, how do you fund people as well as part of your network security monitoring strategy that have the right expertise and the time, right, to go out and actually um, respond to these things. So your real decision, right, is, well, do I, you know, 
put a security guard rather than in every aisle of the store. You know, maybe I can put them looking at one aisle of the store. Uh, but you're going to use things like the motion detector or a video camera type of strategy to essentially scale your visibility and your response. So you can have a security guard you know, looking at those alerts or potentially looking at video cameras or other things and then responding uh, to any potential event or incident that um, the guard sees. And so really what you probably have is, is a blend there, and it's really not an either-or um, you know, type, uh, type of discussion because it's probably not cost-effective right, to, to use the human element to look um, you know, across every single aisle in the store. Okay, so let's bring this back to some of the uh, high-level technical concepts. So you know, kind of the security guard approach, uh, we're thinking about that way, I would call that the thick sensor architecture. Right? And so this is something that you see um, you know, in a lot of you know, smaller types of environments. And the idea here is that all the data that you're collecting about the cybersecurity status of a site resides at that site. Now, you may have some access to that you know, centrally to log in or pull different data or query the, the database of information that you have you know, at that site uh, you know, from, a, from a central site or, or something like that. Um, but essentially, you've got stuff that's sitting you know, on a site-by-site -site, uh, type of basis. So what are some examples of things I would consider you know, a thick um, architecture design? So one good example is a vendor provided what I call the security rack, right? where you kind of check the, the box, like power generation is a great example, right? and you get this whole rack of security servers and other stuff that kind of you know, comes with the, the product and that sits at your site. You know, maybe someone's logging in to do a you know, level of monitoring. Other approaches, uh, SIM or SIEM, right, that sits at the site and collects all the logs and information from the site. Um, and any sort of other, like, local-only deployment option, right, where the idea is that um, individuals who are there at the site are going to log in and take care of this stuff and do the analysis of, of all the things that are at the site. So, you know, kind of what's the, the case? What are the pros and cons of this? So, you know, I think the, the first thing is that um, you know, it can be managed locally, and I, that's been traditionally attractive in the industrial control system space uh, because uh, you don't need to provide any outside access, right? Perhaps uh, the decision making is being driven by, um, you know, plant managers or engineering, you know, local to the sites, uh, and so you can kind of keep this you know, self-contained to the facility. Um, it you know, really allows you to focus on that site because the architecture and everything that you've built is specific to that site, so you can kind of go, go deep right back to the depth versus breadth approach. Um, and you have the potential to capture you know, some more stuff, right? So maybe because you're only really looking at one site, you want to capture a lot of historical data right, from, from that site. Um, but what are some of the challenges, right? The first one is the one that I addressed in the thought exercise around, um, you know, if it's a, if it's a more expensive and a, and a heavier type of solution, um, you know, you may not be able to cover all your, your sites. And that's not just from a, you know, a, a technology perspective. It's from the fact that now if it's local, you need a person, right, that's going to actually look through that stuff at every single site. And that does not, you know, really scale from a human resource perspective, right? Um, the second thing is that you've now got these islands of data, right? So correlation amongst things that are happening at the site is uh, a potential, um, but looking across all of your different sites, if you have a large environment, you're running multiple sites, um, you know, there's, there's some challenges with that, right? You have to allow remote access to, to make that happen. Um, you know, you've got to uh, you know, be doing the analysis, um, different things like that locally, and, and can't sort of correlate across sites. Uh, and then, you know, the heavier your sensor is and the more detection, analysis, all sorts of technical requirements that you load on that individual device, um, you know, the more you're, you're likely to pay in terms of hardware, storage costs, right, different things like that. Cool. So what's the thin sensor approach? Uh, so the idea here is that uh, the sensors that are out at each facility are basically going to capture either metadata or you know, alerts. So let's say, um, back to the physical security example, there are security systems that when a door alarm goes off, 
the person who's monitoring um, you know, things from a physical security perspective is going to see maybe 10 seconds before and 10 seconds after that door alarm went off, and that video you know, is, is captured, right? So you can do sort of an alert-driven um, you know, subsection right, of, of looking at like full packet capture right, or different things like that. Uh, and so you just have uh, detection happening at the site, but then all that stuff is pushed back centrally, and the analysis can happen at a, at a central location. So what are some examples, right? If you were to uh, place you know, something like a bro sensor right, out, out at every site, that's an example right, of something where you're just seeing you know, a little bit, right, metadata, other things from each site. Uh, I think another good example, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the detection methodology right, that, that we're talking about. It's more of sort of the architecture and whether it's distributed, um, centralized in some way or not. Um, think about like, you know, just placing some sort of virtualized sensor right, that's at the ingress, egress to IT and OT. So you're not going to see process control specific traffic unless it happens to hit you know, that sensor that's going to sit you may be at the core switch of your network, um, but you're still seeing something. You're seeing everything that's kind of going in and out of that location. So that's another example um, you know, that I would uh, consider in terms of a, a thinner type of a design. So you know, what's, uh, what are the pros and cons here? Well, I think it's, it's reasonable to cover every site because um, you can kind of rely on more standardized types of, of deployment and it's kind of simpler um, methodology. Um, you can do centralized management, centralized analytics, uh, and because of the lighter weight you know, hardware requirements, we talked about virtualization, right? different things that might be available on the IT side of the network at the ingress-egress point, if there is one, um, you know, that's pretty attractive. Um, the issues, well, you're only getting a subset of the data. You don't you know, really see everything. Um, you know, there are in, like, let's take Bro for an example, right? You've got like, DNP3, Modbus types of signatures, things like that. Um, but, you know, not the level of, of depth of something that obviously would be, you know, ICS specific. Um, so those are some of the, the drawbacks. So here's some anecdotes from, you know, some real asset owner environments and, and things that I've observed. I want to share these and then kind of share some, some thoughts around those. Uh, so the first example is finding commodity malware. So now the technical information on here is from log data. Um, so obviously that sort of gets away from the, the network uh, security monitoring piece, but there's a point on that that I want to make uh, as well. Um, but certainly if you were looking at this stuff from a network perspective, um, you could use kind of similar detection. Um, so you know, at this facility uh, that was not supposed to be connecting to the internet, or there was I think one sort of third party connection, um, observed that there was a machine that was trying to communicate to the internet. And when we did some research on the IP address, we found that that IP address was uh, previously associated with the Mariposa botnet. And by the way, this was last year, and so you can go look up like when the Mariposa botnet got shut down. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, and so, you know, kind of further investigation, this machine is still trying to reach out to this old command and control from the Mariposa botnet. And so, did some forensic investigation on the machine, and sure enough, um, something like, you know, six or seven years earlier, uh, there, someone plugged in a USB stick that introduced this commodity botnet malware um, onto a control system that the asset owner uh, had mentioned in our discussions was really significant to their operation and to the, the safety of, of their operation. And uh, you know, compromising this machine would have you know, shut down the, the, the process. They just weren't aware right, that they were compromised at, at that point. Um, so that's an example of one thing. And, and this is something that it's as simple to detect this as understanding that, hey, one of these machines is trying to connect to the internet, right? That's a pretty sort of simple detection rule. The next example is, um, and, and by the way, that first one was with a, with a thick sensor approach. I think it was really necessary to use a, a thick sensor, right, to look at that, and I uh, showed the logs as well. Um, the next one, uh, public IP address. This is kind of a fun one. So uh, deployed a thin sensor 
into the environment and then started again to look just at basic communication flows. And one thing that was puzzling in the traffic that we started to analyze was that there were public IP addresses uh, communicating to other public IP addresses. And this was within a you know, power generation facility. Uh, and so you know, this is another facility that was not supposed to be connected to, uh, to the internet. And so upon researching further, talking to the ass owner about the environment, the discovery was the DCS was set up uh, you know, by an integrator or by the vendor with a public IP address space assigned to all the different hosts. And so what we were seeing was actually normal traffic on the internal network, and we were lucky to get you know, confirmation that you know, all that traffic was really contained within the internal network, but the risk that was identified was obviously they were one misconfiguration away from having their control system connected to the internet. And so, you know, as I go through these, these examples, I mean, one of the things, you know, after both those engagements and both those situations, I never said to myself, man, you know, I only wish that if at that facility we had more visibility into the, like, you know, Modbus traffic, right, between the different devices, we, you know, we really would have found something or we would have been able to add more value. Um, you know, I never thought about more site-specific monitoring. In both those situations, we were at one site of maybe, you know, 80 or more, right, in one case, or, you know, about 10 or so in the other case, uh, that this asset owner operated. But our scope was only one site. So for me, the, the real thing was, well, man, I wish I had more breadth of monitoring. Because if we found these really obvious things in about five or 10 minutes at one site, um, what could we have found you know, by looking across the entire environment, right? And so that gets me thinking about you know, why do we typically get into a depth-only approach? And I'm not advocating that it's either a question of depth or breadth. I think there needs to be you know, probably a, a combination. Um, but, uh, and, and I think you can start either way effectively as well. But I think you know, one reason is IT, OT politics, right? You can't touch my site, right? And I'm not gonna get IT coming in. Um, the other thing is, you know, data and remote access fears, right? So, well, you're not connecting my control system uh, to the internet to monitor it, you know, if you're supposed to be providing security value, doesn't connecting me, you know, make me less secure. Um, a lack of network understanding. I think the first two are, are, you know, excuses in some cases. The third one, I think, is more of a reason, right, around, well, look, you know, we got to really kind of understand more about one example site and learn some things and then maybe replicate that, right, across everything. So you want to go deep first to kind of get grounded, right, on a technical sampling of what your sites look like. Um, and the last piece is, you know, misconceptions that ICS attacks are always ICS-specific attacks. And I'll share one more anecdote here. Uh, I was working with an engineer uh, at a chemical facility, uh, and the engineer was really fixated on spending as much time as possible on securing OSI Pi communications. And that was certainly something that we... Um, identified in the threat model as a risk. And as I started to focus more and more on the perimeter of the network, this engineer got more and more agitated about why we weren't looking at the OSI Pi traffic. But it turned out, by focusing on the perimeter and the firewall configuration, we found out that the guest wireless network had a network route into the DCS network. And so, you know, that was a case of, you know, we we're really looking at OSI Pi, but the real risk, in, in my opinion, right, was uh, not really ICS specific. It was an IT uh, misconfiguration. So I want to propose a uh, maturity model or, or perhaps a step-by-step -step approach uh, to network security monitoring. And this is, you know, uh, open for discussion, I would say. I don't think there's enough mature implementations that are out there, and, and let's try to evolve this together um, you know, as an industry. Uh, but the first thing is you know, network segmentation. So you know, 
do you have your network segmented? Do you know what defines ICS assets versus other assets? You should probably do that first, right, and have a firewall or other delineation, right, across your network, or at least have some understanding of what subnet your ICS is on. So um, some organizations, there's politics or other types of things where, you know, the firewall is not an option. Um, so maybe you do skip, you know, straight to monitoring and at least understanding, I want an alert every time my ICS talks to any other untrusted network. You know, the second thing is understanding what you already have, right? So if you have logs, if you have security software, other things in the environment, collect that stuff. Um, because in terms of the budget conversation that we started with, you're going to need to justify that what you have is not good enough. So that's an important step. Um, you know, the next thing is to make sure, once you've analyzed the data that you have, do you have the right people um, with the right skill set to actually analyze that data and do something about it? Uh, from there, I would suggest starting with ingress, egress monitoring to really understand what's going in and out of a particular site. And then finally, um, you know, move on to going into the, the depth of, you know, what are some of the site-specific things that I need to do here, or what process-specific type of monitoring, um, you know, do I want to go into? And so I think that's the, the appropriate progression, um, but really interested in, in talking to everybody about that. So what are some, uh, some design principles here to close out? Um, so I covered earlier uh, you know, your different approaches. So just to kind of give you a sense of you know, what I think the options are, you can go for full packet capture, right? Essentially look at you know, all the network traffic and record all that. You can look at metadata, things like conversations or strip out um, specific things like DNS, right, or, or other types of metadata from, from the network traffic. And then you can do the alert-driven approach, which is the one that I mentioned around. When I drive an alert, I want to capture you know, full PCAP sort of around the time of that alert so I can do some human analysis and I'm not left with you know, sort of just the alert. So, so I think those are, are probably your, your three best options, uh, and there may be more. So the first point, and again, trying to debunk some of those, those myths or, or reasons um, you know, not to, to uh, you know, approach uh, all sites versus going deep on, on one site. Uh, visibility is not necessarily access. So one of the first things I mentioned is, well, you can't connect my plant to some sort of central monitoring. Um, but there are ways to do that, right? And there's numerous talks about data diodes, unidirectional gateways, even something like a network tap, it requires an outage, but if you look on a network tap, right, the part that you're plugging your network sensor into says TX, right, and, and that's it. And it certainly depends on the, the tap that you buy, um, but if you're worried about that, you can you know, have uh, you know, no physical you know, layer back in, right? It's, it's a management network. And then you have things like span ports, which are popular because they're passive, um, but again, you are vulnerable to misconfiguration uh, different things like that, and outbound DMZ approaches, right? So there are ways to get visibility and data out of a site without giving people access into it. So, um, you know, the next thing is to really take stock of what you have in place. And so this is looking through, um, you know, the different uh, information that you already have in the environment, whether that be logs, things like firewalls, um, and really analyzing, you know, what are, uh, what are the things that you can look at today that you already have to, to learn some things from. The, uh, the next piece is addressing uh, low-hanging fruit at the perimeter of, of the network. So these are some of the ideas, like you know, when you drop in a network sensor and just sort of look at you know, some of the, uh, the communication paths, for example, you'll find things like machines that are connecting to the internet, um, you know, and those are things that you can you know, very quickly find and represent potentially a large risk to the environment. So um, things that I talked about, like you know, pulling out what DNS requests are in the environment. I think one of the more interesting ones here is also what software. So if you're seeing different user agents, you're now finding vulnerabilities in the environment. Just by looking at metadata from the network traffic, you can see where is outdated software. Is anyone trying to use unauthorized remote access methods like TeamViewer or LogMeIn, different things like that. And that's all possible you know, just with looking at, at metadata data. 
And uh, you know, the next piece is centralizing the data for analysis. Um, so bringing, um, you know, really thinking about the human element. So, uh, you know, visibility is just a portion of the battle. So if you think about how to do effective incident response, right, you've got to have governance, you've got to measure it, right, you've got to have all these other processes in place for how you respond, and so visibility is only one portion. So you've got to think about the human element, you know, how are you going to collect information, how are you going to you know, respond to the different alerts um, that you see, and then, you know, is the data that you're using uh, you know, actually useful and the things that you're looking at. So the concept of a, of a use case um, really brings you through uh, the process of, you know, what do I want to detect? How do I detect that using the data that I have? Are there any gaps in the data that I need, right, to order to effectively or quicker or better detect that? And then, you know, what's the process when I see that for going and investigating? Uh, and, and remediating that. So kind of to close out here, um, you know, in terms of further reading, so the inspiration uh, for this presentation uh, was really a couple different blog posts and, and talks. You can check out uh, Mike Reeves. Uh, he's got a presentation uh, from Brocon a few years ago around some of the architectural elements that I covered and how to deploy different thin sensors. Um, and then a blog post uh, from Chris Sanders, uh, which is sort of the idea uh, that I borrowed and, and applied to ICS here around security guards versus video cameras. So those are some things you might look into. And then I know this is a high-level talk around sort of strategy and, and how do you do um, you know, the implementation, uh, but uh, there's also, if you want to go deeper on the technical stuff, right here are some of the open source software packages that are out there for detection. Um, you know, things like Bro, Suricata, um, Analysis, Squeal is a really cool tool that'll help, you know, analysts look at different alerts and disposition them. Um, and then lastly, uh, the sensor management. And we start to talk about thin sensors. How do you manage this big network of, of sensors and the sensor grid that you've developed? And so there's some DevOps approaches and different things where, you know, with a few clicks, um, you can make a change to your base image and then kind of deploy that, you know, out to, to different sensors to, to manage them. So that's another interesting thing um, to look at as well. And with that, be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we have a couple of time, a little bit of time for questions here. Okay. Hey, Dan. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the presentation. It was really good. So um, I guess when you roll into a place and you see, uh, you know, public IP addresses um, being used on the inside, and then you, you know, you see basically commodity malware in ICS systems, the the question becomes is, you know, how how do the organizations take that news that they've basically failed at networking and they've like failed in the inside of the most sensitive part of the business? How do you present that to the C-suite without, you know, getting tossed out a window. Yeah, I mean, I can talk, you know, a, a little bit about, I guess, those two examples. I think on the commodity malware piece, um, in the particular example that I talked about, there was definitely a, a realization at a, at a management level and a technical management level of that they had a near miss, right, if you want to put it in safety terms, around, well, this could have been much worse. It was, the intent was not, you know, to disrupt or do anything, but if that was the intent, um, you know, that was a very serious situation. And so, you know, that really, in that case, the depth, you know, approach of going deep on one site led to breadth. So that organization actually um, went ahead and monitored all their sites as a result of that find. I think they sort of had you know, buy-in and realization they wanted to do that anyway, um, but that was you know, good validation right, in that site. And that's you know, another sort of scary thing is what if we picked another site right, where there was no commodity malware? Um, might, not have, might not have found that. Um, you know, in sort of the other case around the public IP address, um, you know, I think 
uh, I think if you, you know, start to look at the risk, I mean, ultimately it wasn't connected to the internet, but uh, managing you know, change control and a different mitigating control. So I don't think um, you know, there was as much alarm in that particular case, but um, I think there's certainly a conversation you know, with the vendor and, and sort of a, a long-term you know, plan of action, right, for you know, how do we make sure that we've, you know, we're, we're looking at this and, and mitigating this. We don't want it to happen again. What's our plan for fixing it on the next upgrade or, or maintenance window? Is that really, is, is that viable, right? So that was more of a tactical um, kind of kind of view. So that's helpful, that's what happened in both cases. Other questions? You know, you, in your example at the beginning, you had uh, everything in technology cost, and you said it was a trick question, and we, people processes need to be in there as well. I was wondering if, if you could, I guess this is more of a comment than a question, if you could also, as you're developing this strategy, if you could be thinking about the um, efficiency of the analysis of the data you're going to get. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, alerts that are a very high probability of requiring some action as opposed to alerts that are occurring all the time and you have to analyze to determine which one is actually an incident and which one is not an incident. You, yep. you probably uh, you know, if you have a limited budget to do detection and you're looking for the most efficient way of doing it, you probably would want to consider how easy or hard it's going to be to use the data that you're getting from whatever thin or thick solution you propose. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, alert fatigue is a thing, right? And the efficiency of the analysts and of the SOC, right? And so that's something that um, kind of glossed over it quickly, but in the recommendations around, you know, what is your response strategy? Key things got to be metrics, right? I think the first thing you measure is time from detection to response, right? Because that's really overall, you know, how well are you doing at, at finding stuff? Uh, but I think some of the other things have to be around the efficiency of, you know, what percentage of alerts are we dispositioning with no action, right? Because are, those are potentially useless alerts um, and different types of measurements uh, specific to what you learn as you start to get that visibility into the environment so that you're constantly improving. But th there's definitely some low-hanging fruit, like if you're watching your security perimeter device to your ICS and you see traffic going to a known command and control malware server, yep. that's, that's a pretty clear indication you have a problem. There's not a lot of false <laughs> positives there. Yep.